Welcome. My name's Debbie Hoke, and I'm a member at Derry Presbyterian Church, and we are thrilled you're with us today. And, and um, special welcome to all those who are visiting with us. We're delighted that you're here. This is the first of a four-part uh, series on Christian nationalism, which is a topic of importance, I think anyway, for every Christian of every time and in every place. Um, and we're asking, uh, just out of courtesy, if you'll mute your microphones uh, to eliminate any background noise, but feel free to submit questions through the chat feature. And we're gonna have some time at the end, uh, we hope for some questions and answers. So um, make sure you keep your questions with you. Our guest for this series is Dr. John Fia. And we are thrilled to have John return to Derry. And if Christine uh, joins us, we're glad she's helped us set this up. So we're hoping that she joins us too. As most of you know, uh, John's professor of American history and department chair at Messiah University. He's the author of a number of books. I'm not gonna um, tell you all of those. And for the dairy folks, um, most of those are in our church library. So if you don't have them at home, you can access those. But um, I appreciate uh, John's take on things because he comes at this through the spectacles of faith. And um, we're thrilled to have him here. Uh, a lot has happened in the world and in the country since John was with us last. So uh, we're delighted that he's here. He's gonna be here through uh, today and the next three weeks. So we hope you'll be able to come back and join us. So uh, welcome John Fia to Derry and to this series. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. Good, thank you so much for that introduction. Thank you for inviting me back. Um, I don't know, three or four times maybe I'm thinking. Yeah. I, I remember I remember I think my first visit may have been over a decade ago when I when the book Was America Founded as a Christian Nation first came out. Um, I seem to remember doing something on kind of Presbyterians and presidents <laughs> at one point, right? Yeah. You know, <laughs> um, right. you know the 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 uh, the Presbyterian presidents we talked about Woodrow Wilson and you know some of those. Um, but yeah, it's always it's always a pleasure. I wish we could be face to face, but we live in a Zoom world now. Hopefully, the next time I come, it'll be back down there in your uh, what is that your fellowship hall room or your Sunday school room where I was um, where I had been um, the last time. I am going to share my screen, so you're going to see me up in the corner here most of the time. Um, because I have a, a slide presentation that I want to talk through here. From what I understand, we are going from, um, or we are going till 945. Um, I will probably stop somewhere in the 935 range, open it up for questions. Um, and then I'm told it's a hard stop uh, at 10 o'clock, but I know some of you need to leave uh, at 945. Um, let me just share that. Can you all, let me just get that on the slideshow. Can you all see that? Yeah, it's there. All right, good. Um, so this question of, uh, again, this question of Christian nationalism, um, I would, Christian nationalism, that, that particular phrase is, at least I see it as a relatively new term. Uh, when I was here, when I was here 10 years ago, uh, or 11, whenever I was here the first time, um, Christian nationalism was not part of the kind of vernacular, the common vernacular. Uh, I had written a book, as I just mentioned before, called Was America Founded as a Christian Nation? And that was a discussion of American history and the relationship between religion and the American founding. Um, and certainly there were many, many um, people, especially on the so-called Christian right, who were promoting the idea that America was founded as a Christian nation and uh, should return, quote unquote, to uh, its Christian roots. But, um, I think that that view, which again had always been out there and had informed certain kind of um, a certain kind of politician and uh, an evangelical leader, 
um, really kind of got um, got empowered in some ways uh, in the in the Trump era. Uh, and journalists and sociologists and other kinds of scholars began to use this term Christian nationalism uh, to write about a phenomenon that I always felt I had been writing about for years, but had now taken on a kind of strong political uh, dimension uh, and had gotten very, very close, if not completely in uh, the corridors of, of American power uh, in the Trump era. And thus this idea of Christian nation nationalism kind of emerged, and, and I'll try to define it here in a second, but um, I think it's important to just see, uh, to start off here, the kind of, you know, the kind of uh, development over time of, of these phrases. Now, what I want to do in the four weeks, since this is our first week, I'll kind of introduce the series to you. Uh, what I want to do today is I want to just take care of some definitional matters um, and think about, you know, what the terms are that we're going to be using here over the course of the next three weeks after, after today. Uh, what is the difference between uh, Christian nationalism and, for example, something that often gets thrown around and you hear a lot called uh, the word, the term civil religion, uh, which is, you know, perhaps a term you're familiar with. Um, what does the idea of Christian nationalism today have to do with the more historical um, debate that I've been a part of for years now over was America founded as a Christian nation? So in other words, what did it look like in the past? What does it look like now in the present? How is the idea that America was founded as a Christian nation uh, playing itself out in political life today? So uh, I, wanna, I wanna make sure we understand what we're talking about. And then I think uh, we'll go into the history uh, for the next uh, three weeks after today. The idea that America was founded as a Christian nation is the foundation of this political ideology, political movement, if you wanna call it that, known as Christian nationalism. Um, and I am still under the uh, belief that, uh, of the belief that um, if you can show that the founding era uh, of the United States was a little more complicated than simply the founders trying to create a Christian country that we have to get back to, um, that is going to problematize the way in which uh, the Christian right um, especially uh, the most uh, conservative branches of evangelical Christianity, political branches, um, engage with politics uh, today. So, so I want to get back into the roots. I want to talk about, you know, the role of Christianity at the time of the founding, looking at the role of uh, that the Bible and Christian theology played uh, at the time of the founding, or perhaps didn't play at the time of the founding. Um, I want to get into a discussion in week three about some of our core uh, documents, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, some of the early state constitutions, what those things said about Christianity, about God, about faith, about religion. And then I want to talk about how the founding fathers um, and this will be week four, we'll talk about some of the religious faith of the founding fathers and whether or not the, the religious faith of the founding fathers has anything to do with the kind of nation they wanted to establish. So again, that's just projecting, kind of foreshadowing what's to come, trying to get you to show up for the next, <laughs> for the next three weeks uh, here. But, but um, that's kind of my agenda. And um, so today I wanna to focus largely on definitions. So let me go to the next slide here. Everybody see that okay? Um, and here I want to uh, think about a difference, a fundamental difference that exists in the United States, or as, as I see it at least, between something called civil religion and something called Christian nationalism. 
Now, for civil religion, I've relied on probably the foremost scholar, current living scholar, at least, of civil religion. Uh, this is the Yale uh, sociologist, uh, Philip Gorski, uh, who wrote an outstanding book on the history of civil religion in America. Gorski was a student of uh, a sociologist named Robert Bella, who had actually written one of the definitive works on uh, civil religion um, in an essay he wrote in the 1960s, 1967. And Gorski studied under Bella and has really advanced, I think, some of, some of Bella's work. Some of you may be familiar with Robert Bella uh, for his, I think he published this in the 1980s, his book, The Habits of the Heart, uh, which dealt with individualism uh, in American society. So Gorski defines civil religion this way. Civil religion is the way a particular people thinks about the transcendent purposes of life together. In other words, what are the ideals, the values uh, that transcend you know, our lives, you know, that, that hold a society together? Uh, civil religion is in some ways the the social and cultural glue or cement that holds a community, a nation, uh, in this case of the United States, together. Uh, Gorski goes on to say, one might understand transcendent, right, in a traditional religious sense. So civil religion often makes appeals, for example, to God, uh, to, to faith. Um, or one might understand it as some kind of ultimate value or higher purpose that a nation or a polity is built around. Um, so what we mean by civil religion, like any religion, is religion uh, is always understood as a set of ideals. And those ideals are often play out or seen in certain kinds of symbols, certain kinds of rituals that define and hold together a nation. So the idea, for example, of in God we trust uh, on, on currency would be an example of civil religion. Uh, singing the Star Spangled Banner as a national anthem, right, is almost like an, you know, it's like singing in church a praise hymn, right? You're, you're singing a, a, a praise to the nation, right? You're, you're connecting with this, with this ritual of singing uh, the national anthem or saying the Pledge of Allegiance. You know, the, the word under God was put in the Pledge of Allegiance in the 1950s. But even saying the Pledge of Allegiance before God was put in in the 1950s would have been an act of civil religion, right? An act of kind of, um, you know, again, religious worship, if you will, uh, of, of the nation. Um, you know, when, when presidents say, you know, God bless America or God bless our troops or, you know, um, civil religion is something that has transcended uh, political parties. Uh, it's something that politicians will often invoke in order to stir a sense of unity, a sense of fellow feeling uh, among uh, the nation. Um, and if I could go to the next slide, uh, uh, another definition here, and this comes from um, two sociologists, current sociologists named Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry. I think this also kind of builds on this idea a little bit. They say civil religion represents America's dominant self-understanding, and it should be ethical there, ethical lodestar. Uh, its religious influences, you know, what, what informs civil religion, in other words, its religious influences come primarily from the prophetic Old Testament tradition. Uh, in other words, there is something Old Testament, there's something Judeo-Christian in some ways about American civil religion uh, in the sense that civil religion demands justice, mercy, humility. Uh, you could add to this the sort of dignity of human beings, the idea that, for example, um, you know, all men are created equal because of that dignity. But it also, civil religion also sort of merges 
uh, with these re old religious Judeo-Christian ideas, uh, it merges a kind of more secular enlightenment uh, from the 18th century political philosophy that emphasizes civic virtue, right? The idea that a republic only survives if individuals are willing to at times lay down certain individual rights to serve the public good for the for the greater good the common good right you know the military for example is built upon the idea of civic re civil religion right the idea that you are willing to die uh, you love your country so much, you love your country to such an extent that you are willing to serve your country and perhaps even die for the cause uh, of your country. Um, so again, civil religion comes from this idea of civic virtue, right? Uh, and what, what the 18th century founders meant by virtue was, again, this idea of, of sacrificing for the common good. And of course, a strong constitution that separates institutional powers, right? Balance of powers, um, you know, because the balance of powers uh, prevents uh, tyranny. It prevents one uh, leader from dominating uh, the people, from acting in a way that will uh, take away the people's rights. So, so this idea of a strong constitution that separates institutional powers is critical for maintaining free human societies. So again, American civil religion, if we can go back to that first definition, uh, is this convergence of this kind of God language, this kind of idea that all human beings um, have dignity and worth, uh, that um, there is some kind of uh, Judeo-Christian, vague kind of Judeo-Christian values associated with it. And the Enlightenment idea that, you know, the best forms of government are those that celebrate the individual, protect the individual from tyranny, um, and that, um, you know, teach civic virtue. So we see civil religion all over um, the United States. As a matter of fact, America is born with a kind of civil religion, the ideals, right? You know, some would say the Declaration of Independence, and we'll talk about this in another week, the Declaration of Independence, one historian has described as American scripture, right? In a very kind of civil religion type way. In other words, right, if the Bible is the scripture of Christianity, then the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution perhaps is the civil religion, right? Or the, the scripture of American civil religion. Um, and then of course, there are all kinds of other rituals, you know, associated with, with American civil religion. Now, I think um, since we're doing this in a sort of Sunday school class here, issues class at a church, um, you know, one also has to realize there is a fundamental difference between civil religion and uh, the teachings of New Testament Christianity. So one, as a Christian, one could certainly offer a serious critique of civil religion, right? Civil religion is not the be-all, end-all, right? And in fact, there may be moments when the Christian church must um, critique or stand up against a kind of civil religion that perhaps uh, gets us involved in kind of, you know, unwanted or unjust wars, for example, or, you know, sacrificing for uh, the nation in a way that might undermine uh, Christian faith, right? Uh, so don't give, don't get me wrong. I think civil religion certainly does fuse um, Christianity and, uh, or certain Judeo-Christian principles and, and the enlightenment. But there's also a Christian, you could make a Christian critique, but that, that's not sort of in our scope right now of, of discussion for this, for this class, but I just wanted to mention it. So on the right side there of the slide, uh, we're back to Whitehead and Perry again. I, I definitely recommend if you really want to dig into this book, um, I read Gorski's book is entitled American Covenant. Very, very good. It's, it's, again, it's a nice little introduction to civil religion. Uh, Whitehead and Perry are sociologists who have published a recent book called Taking America Back for God. 
and it is a sociological study of um, the idea of Christian nationalism. And what Whitehead and Perry, how they define then Christian nationalism is a, as a cultural framework that idealizes and advocates a fusion of Christianity with American civil life, so civic life. So in some ways there's, you know, a similar definition to, to civil religion, right? That so far it doesn't necessarily seem like there's much difference between Christian nationalism and civic religion. But then the rest of this definition, I think, is, is important. Um, it fuses Christianity with American civil life and, and with American civil life um, with, partic with a particular type of Christian identity. And those who talk about Christian nationalism will normally talk about the ways in which uh, a conservative brand of evangelical Christianity since the 1980s uh, has tried to argue for the fact that America was founded as a distinctly and unique Christian nation, not just these vague references to God, like in God we trust or a creator God, like it says in the Declaration of Independence or a, you know, some kind of, um, some kind of deist God that's nature's God, like Jefferson says, but rather, uh, they argue that those references to God, like, for example, in God we trust on money, uh, the founders meant those to be clear references to uh, the evangelical Christian God, right? The God who manifested himself in the form of a man, died for the sins of the world. Uh, America wanted, the American founders wanted to privilege this religion over all others. Uh, America was founded as a new kind of Israel, a city upon a hill. God's chosen people is often used. Um, again, privileging Christianity over all other religions. And somewhere along the way, Christian nationalists believe that Christian founding or that Christian culture that the founders created uh, was lost or is in a state of decline. And the goal of politics then is to try to reclaim, restore, renew that Christian nation so that we can, um, you know, advance whatever uh, particular biblical principles they believe are the most important ones. So uh, again, it, it's, it's hard to see it. Sometimes it's a fine difference between civil religion and Christian nationalism. Both civil religion and Christian nationalism are used for political purposes. Um, you know, you know, you, you know, just Joe Biden, you know, in his speech the other day, you know, in Congress, you know, invoked civil religion multiple times, you know, he even ended saying, God bless America and our troops, right? That was, a, that was an example of civil religion. Um, but Christian nationalism is something that is connected, has a particular history, and I want to talk about it here in a couple minutes, but a particular history connected directly to the evangelical, conservative evangelicals attempt to, as, as Whitehead and Perry write in the title of their book, take America back for God. So how does this play out? How has this played out in American history? Um, Oh, here's Gorski one more time. This is, a, again, one more definition kind of reflects what I was just saying. Um, Gorski says the racial, uh, the racial secular interpretation, that should be the radical, I'm sorry, miss, there's a misspelling there. The radical secular interpretation of American history is that American democracy is an enlightenment project based solely on secular values. The religion, na religious nationalist or Christian nationalist interpretation is that America was founded as a Christian nation and our laws and constitutions are all grounded in Christian or Judeo scripture. At many junctures of our history, those two sources have been intertwined with each other. And sometimes it's very, very difficult when you read American history to separate them. So for example, here is a quote from the Constitution of the Confederate States of America. This is the Confederacy, right? When they broke away from the Union uh, prior to the Civil War. This is right from the preamble. We, the Confederate States, 
each state's acting in its sovereign and independent character in order to form a permanent federal government, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility. By the way, that should all sound very familiar to you if you know the preamble to the United States Constitution. And secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, invoking the favor and guidance of Almighty God do ordain and establish this constitution for the Confederate States of America. The United States Constitution actually does not have any references to God, but the, the Confederate Constitution does. There's a history behind why that's the case, because the Confederate Constitution believed that God was actually on their side uh, in the Civil War. Um, and they really did believe that the, the, the Christian God was intervening on their behalf. They believed that slavery was ordained by God. Um, so again, it's hard to tell. On one sense, the, the Confederate States of America is invoking a kind of, you know, civil religion, right? Uh, God, we're invoking almighty God, right? They're not invoking Jesus Christ or the resurrection or these kinds of things. But if you dig deeper, they're all, they also believe that the Christian Confederacy is a Christian nation. There's a certain sense of Christian nationalism here, even before that word you know, was in vogue. Liberal, Protestants, um, you know, also kind of invoke this kind of language that's somehow difficult to distinguish between civil religion and Christian nationalism. This is Washington Gladden. Uh, the founder of a movement at the turn, late 19th turn of the 20th century known as the Social Gospel. Uh, the Social Gospel was a movement to try to bring uh, Christianity to bear on the social problems of the age, poverty, homelessness, immigration, industrialization, these kinds of things. But listen to this. Um, this almost sounds like it could be uttered by a Christian nationalist today, right? Um, every department of human life, the family, schools, amusements, arts, businesses, uh, politics, industry, national politics, international relations will be governed by the Christian law and controlled by Christian influences. When we are bidden to seek first the kingdom of God, we are bidden to set our hearts on this great commission to keep this always before us as the object of our endeavors to be satisfied with nothing less than this. The complete Christianization of all life is what we pray and work for when we work and pray for the coming of the kingdom of God. Washington Gladden believed that if justice would prevail, right, if, if the poor would be fed, if the suffering would, uh, would be, you know, their suffering would be alleviated, if um, America, you know, was just more concerned about the plight of the least of these, as Jesus said, then America would become a more Christian nation. We would become a Christian culture again. Um, again, notice he doesn't say things like, you know, if we can just, you know, get capitalism to work right, or if we can solve, you know, get abortion to be uh, done away with, or if we can defend traditional marriage, we'll become a more Christian nation. Of course, those were not primary issues. Well, capitalism was, but you know, back then. This would have been like in the 19 teens that he would have said this. So very much concerned about creating a Christian culture, a Christian nation. But this looks very different from the kind of Christian nation that, that we see today in what we're I'm defining as Christian nationalism. You know, you have Billy Graham, who in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, when he was at his height, was constantly preaching not only, you know, repent and be saved and be born again, but he was also fighting communism. He was also advocating a kind of civil religion, a Judeo-Christian kind of nation that would be a counter to the so-called godless communists. Many of them thought that many, many of uh, Graham's followers believed godless communism was one word, right? It was so, they were so connected. Um, so you see Graham here with Dwight Eisenhower, the, the, the great president of civil religion, who said, like, I don't care what religion you are, just pick one. We're a nation of faith, right? You know, great example of civil religion. And, and Graham tried to say, well, here's a particular kind of faith that everybody must embrace. If everyone would just become born again, we'd become a more of a Christian culture. Uh, Martin Luther King. Um, 
often invoke the idea of America as a Christian nation in a way that kind of fused civil religion with um, you know, Christian values. This, is, this quote is fascinating. It's from the letter from a Birmingham jail when he was imprisoned during the, uh, during the, um, the protests in Birmingham, Alabama in the 60s. You know, one day the South will recognize its real heroes. They will be the young high school and college students, the young ministers of the gospel and a host of their elders, courageously and nonviolently sitting in at lunch counters willing and willingly going to jail for conscience sake. One day the South will know that when these disinherited children of God sat down at lunch counters, they were in reality standing up for what is best in the American dream and for the most sacred values in our Judeo-Christian heritage thereby bringing our nation back to those great wells of democracy, which were dug deep by the founders in their formulation of the constitution and the declaration of independence. I mean, this is a, this is a perfect example of the kind of civil religion we're talking about. King not only drew upon the ideals of the Judeo-Christian tradition, he was a minister, of course, but if you read the letter of Birmingham jail, he's also dealing, uh, appealing to the ideals and the values of the founders, the constitution, the declaration of independence, even, Je even Thomas Jefferson, he quotes uh, here, who was a slaveholder. So, so again, you see the, the merging here of these kind, this kind of Judeo-Christian idea of, of, of the dignity of human beings, of rights, of individualism, right? Of justice, liberty and justice for all, right? And Christian faith. So, how does America then move uh, from a nation that sort of celebrates uh, a kind of Christian nationalism to a nation that, I'm sorry, a nation that celebrates a kind of civil religion uh, and still does to this kind of Christian nationalism that we see today? Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on, these, uh, on this timeline um, but I will describe it this way. After World War II, uh, America is going through some serious cultural changes, uh, demographic changes. Um, in 64, uh, Abington and Shemp case removes Bible reading from public schools. The year before that, Engel v. Vital, Supreme Court case, moves prayer, removes prayer from public schools. Uh, in both of those cases, a 1947 case known as Everson v. Board of Education, uh, in which Justice Hugo um, Black said that there is a wall of separation between church and state, and that wall is high and impregnable. That decision was then applied in Engel v. Vital and Abington v. Shemp. In 1965, Lyndon Johnson passes the, or signs the Hart Seller Immigration Act, which allows massive amounts of non-Western immigrants into the country, bringing their religion with them, diversifying the country. The Green Connolly case, which is largely unknown by most Americans, this was the one that forced schools, Christian academies and schools like Bob Jones University to desegregate uh, and essentially to, to lose their tax exempt status if they did not admit African-American students and other students of color. Uh, the South was very upset about this. This was government intervention in their lives, right? And of course you have Roe versus Wade. And then in 1976, the bicentennial year, uh, you have uh, you know, people sort of thinking about the founding, right? They're getting in touch with the founding. They're thinking about the founding fathers. What kind of nation were we founded on? This opens the door uh, for a movement known as the religious right. Uh, some of you are very familiar with Jerry Falwell, uh, one of the leaders of the religious right. And it begins to, at this point, you begin to see the emergence of a new kind of narrative about the founding, that the founding was not the founders, you know, the, it was not sort of enlightenment thinkers and enlightenment ideas, secular ideas, right? 
Um, it wasn't even a blend or a mix of secular ideas and Judeo-Christian ideas like the old civil religion talked about, like Martin Luther King Jr., for example, in the letter from a Birmingham jail. But rather, the United States was founded as a uniquely exceptional, distinctly Christian nation. And in the 1960s, especially for all of those reasons I just showed you on the last slide and into the 1970s, Americans, America's Christian foundation was eroding, right? And we should be fearful of this. We should be worried about this. We have to do something about this. And the way Falwell decided to do something about this was by mobilizing Christians politically to try to reclaim America. We thus see the rise of the moral majority, which was his movement that was replaced by Pat Robertson in the 1990s and the Christian coalition. And we see it in all kinds of other manifestations, um, you know, uh, moving forward. Um, so I think it's not until the 1970s and 1980s that we begin to start to have this debate over the idea of, well, was America founded as a Christian nation? Uh, that debate was not something that, you know, people talked about prior to Falwell and the rise of the moral majority. In other words, this debate that we're having today over whether or not America was founded as a Christian nation is essentially taking a question that emerged about 40 years ago or 45 years ago, and then taking it and superimposing it on founding fathers in the 18th century, who were not really having much of a debate over this question, because America's largely believed that they lived in this kind of uh, Christian, Judeo-Christian nation in which there were liberties and ideals that were also drawn from the Enlightenment. But certainly Christianity was, um, you know, the, the, the Judeo-Christian tradition also informed uh, these things. It was a much more complex and complicated vision of America than what Falwell was trying to uh, produce. This then leads to a host of books, and you know, these are just a few of them. You see, mine is in there too. I joined the conversation about 10 years ago. Um, you know, if you want to get one book on this, I would suggest that you get mine. No, <laughs> just kidding. But, um, you know, obviously, I do think I'd make a contribution here to for, with a kind of nuanced view. But, um, you know, some of these books are defending the idea that America was a Christian nation, like Peter Marshall and David Manuel and David Barton's books. Others are um, much more secular in orientation, like Andrew Seidel's The Founding Myth and Brooke Allen's The Moral Minority. Then you have people writing about this from a Christian perspective, like Gregory Boyd um, and the three historians you see there, Mark Knoll, Nathan Hatch, and George Marsden, who wrote The Search for Christian America. Um, but now we have Sunday school classes like this. We debate, you know, was America founded as a Christian nation? And we, uh, we are currently witnessing, and we've witnessed in the last, I think, five years, the rise of this kind of Christian nationalism uh, promoted by, originally by the Christian right in the 70s and 80s. We're seeing much more of a mainstreaming of this idea. Um, in our culture today. If you believe that America was founded as a Christian nation, that it needs to be restored, renewed, and reclaimed, this is going to deeply affect your politics. And if you have a president of the United States who is encouraging this uh, view of American history, uh, that will give you a certain degree of uh, empowerment um, to do things, to act in certain ways, to vote in certain ways, to say certain things. Um, so I'll stop there for today. That was a very quick 40 minutes, but um, I just wanted to take today to kind of lay out the debate as we're currently having it so that we can then move uh, into some of, the, some of the history over the course of the next three weeks. And we'll always be kind of coming back to, to this debate. We'll be, you know, historians, I like to tell my students, they get jet lag because they're always traveling back and forth between the past and the present. And sometimes that can get very intellectually, uh, intellectually tiring. But I will stop there and I will uh, 
take whatever questions. And as I understand it, Debbie, right, you can move in and out as you like. I will stay here um, until, uh, you know, right before 10. Um, so if you want to stay and answer questions, if not, thank you for thank you for giving me these 45 minutes at least or 40 minutes. John, thank you. I can't see everybody on my screen. So um, I see a question with Patty Joe. You're muted, Patty. Um, okay. I um, enjoyed your uh, definitions. I'm just um, thinking about current news that we hear now, like um, the LG, all those initials. Q LGBTQ. Yeah. yeah. The Proud Boys. Where all do they fit into? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a you know what the debate's all about right now. And depending on how you understand America, what America is, and how America was founded, you will respond to some of these identity groups, if you want to call them that, in very very different ways. Um, again, uh, all of this is about trying to find a past that's usable. Right. I mean, you know, if you can if you can get the founding fathers on your side and maybe find something that fits your present day views in the present, um, you know, that's good. I mean, I often you know, I often um, play around with my students. We Google we Google the word founding fathers in Google News and we look at the way in which the, the term founding fathers has been used in the last week in American news. And, you know, it's amazing, you know, it's the founding, you know, the found, as the founding fathers said, right, the environment was important, as the founding fathers said, right, traditional marriage was important, as the founding fathers said, um, you know, all people should have dignity, including LGBTQ people, as the founding fathers believed, you know, and everybody's using the founding fathers for, for this or that position without really taking a deep look at what the founding fathers thought about these things, if they even thought about them at all. And, you know, how the 18th century world in which they lived was so different from the world we lived in now that sometimes they may not necessarily be particularly useful on these issues. So if you believe that America was founded as a Christian nation and you believe that, um, you know, uh, uh, part of that Christian nation is the traditional family uh, and you believe that, you um, the traditional family is based upon marriage between one man and one woman, uh, then you would, uh, you would uh, try to use history to show that, um, you know, the LGBTQ uh, agenda is undermining this traditional Christian nation. Um, you would have to do some fancy footwork there because the founders didn't necessarily talk about uh, the LGBTQ uh, world. Most of them didn't even know what, um, you know, those, those words in that acronym meant. Um, on the other hand, you know, you may just believe that America, you know, that, that men and women should be, you know, you might believe in traditional marriage, um, but if I tell my students, whatever you believe about marriage, just be careful when you invoke American history uh, to try to make your case in one way or another. It's like, don't, don't, ar you know, feel free to argue your position based upon the Bible, based upon, conscience based upon whatever. Um, I'm in the business of trying to make sure that, you know, we don't manipulate American history to make it fit whatever our personal agenda is. And I think on the right, I think you also see this being done by conspiracy theorists like Q, the Q conspiracy theory. I don't know if any of you have heard of this. You know, we could do a whole class on that. Um, or the Proud Boys or others who are invoking this idea that America is, um, you know, just a, a nation in which everybody is, uh, everybody just has rights, they don't have obligations and duties. And, you know, anybody who, anybody who impedes on those rights, whether it be wearing a mask, having to wear a mask or social distancing and so forth, or, 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 or gun reform or whatever, uh, gun control, is somehow taking away our rights, our Second Amendment rights, or our First Amendment rights, or our freedom of speech, or so forth. Um, so they're going to invoke a certain kind of founding, and I would argue that in many ways they kind of invoke an incomplete founding. 
much in the way that socialists invoke an incomplete founding uh, by saying that it was all about the collective and we always, always sacrifice our rights for the greater good. So, so history, when you study history, it becomes very, very complex. Um, there aren't easy answers when you kind of take an 18th century world and trying to draw lessons in a 21st century world from that 18th century world. And I think that's, um, that's what I'm in the business of trying to do. You know, historians kind of take the smooth places and try to make them a little rougher, uh, if you will. And, um, and, and sometimes history is a little more complex. The human experience as it unfolds over time is a little more complex than simply cherry picking what we need uh, to promote this or that political agenda in the present. So I, you know, we could be here all day answering every little one, Patty Joe, but that's some general principles to think about. John, you can overlay that, that principle you're talking about when you throw the Bible in there. So now oh, yeah, we'll talk about this next week. Um, if you think that the Bible is being used by different people for different ways to promote different kinds of political agendas today, right? And people cherry pick from the Bible for this or that. Uh, the, the come back next week because the case I'm going to make next week is that this has been going on since the birth of the American Republic. So we'll, we'll talk more about that next week. But yeah, good. Great question, Debbie, kind of foreshadowing what's to come and, and to get people to come back. Yeah. I have a question. That's Bill. Hey, Bill. Yes. Uh, I'm, I've always been of the opinion that starting with Falwell, uh, the right has gotten extremely narrow in their thinking. It's usually, this is the way it is and the rest of you are wrong. I was always raised with the idea that the, the, the wider the discussion, the more people involved, the better it is for everybody. That it's, everybody has their free opinion. Everybody has the right to their opinion. And there is no absolute right or wrong answer, because even if you interpret the Bible, I can cherry pick and find chapter and verse that will stand up to my interpretation just as quick as the guy who's on the extreme right can find chapter and verse that takes his position. Yeah. And it's all back to my basic understanding is the fellowship of working together with divergent opinions seeking the greater good and maybe i'm out maybe i'm the guy out of uh kilter here but that's how i've always looked at life we yeah. can always disagree but there's nothing wrong with disagreeing because out of that disagreement we learn a way that's mutual satisfactory to all of us but you got to talk together you got to work together to make this all happen yeah, i think what bill's getting at here is a good point and and i think um it it it, it leads me to sort of bring up a distinction here between um, you know, church and, and, and government, church and democracy, right? Um, in some ways, I should say in almost all ways, the, the movement that Falwell and the Christian right, found, the Christian right is a political movement. It is not the church. It is not a Christ, it is not Christianity. It is a political movement to try to reclaim uh, again, in a very kind of narrow way, what the, this political movement wants America to be, right? So in that sense, um, you know, it does not kind of necessarily respect uh, in a kind of, you know, political way, a kind of government, a kind of, a kind of polity, right, or living together. It doesn't respect kind of the kind of pluralism Right, differing opinions and views the, that's essential to any kind of democracy. In a democracy, uh, you know, we have open debate, right? We have discussion. A democracy doesn't survive unless there's a space in which everybody can come together without being sort of, you know, you know, canceled or whatever the word might be, right? Now, again, you set limits upon that space. You set, you know, you you would, you know, you might say like somebody who is articulating blatant white supremacy and racist ideas uh, may not be welcomed into that into that space, right? 
but but so you you know whatever those boundaries might be on the on the space there's a big wide space there for conversation discussion differing opinions that is democracy and the, one of the biggest flaws of the Christian right movement, which is informed by this idea of Christian nationalism is uh, they want to control that space uh, and they want that space to, they will only want certain visions of America to be articulated in that space. Now I say, you know, the Christian right is a political movement, right? Um, certainly within our own faith traditions, within our churches, within our denominations, within the way we understand the Bible, you know, this is, this is Protestantism, right? You know, some ways what you're articulating, Bill, is the problem of Protestantism, right? You put the, Martin Luther said, put the, John Calvin, we're, we're Presbyterian church, right? So we'll say, John Calvin, right? Put the, put the Bible in the hands of the people and let them read it for themselves, translate it into the vernacular. Well, of course, when you do that, people are going to interpret the Bible in a different way, right? You know, Catholics would say there's one way to interpret the Bible, right? And that's the Pope, right? Although, you know, even Catholics have been divided over that in recent days um, and years and decades. But, but we all then tend to kind of congregate and form communities, denominations, if you will, around particular interpretations of the way we see the scriptures. And we think that those interpretations are the best ways and they're the right ways. And I would not expect, say, uh, a church that believes in pacifism uh, to hire a pastor who believes that war is a good thing, right? Simply because we need to have all kinds of views, right? Um, you know, I think each you know, and maybe there would a church, maybe there is a church that would that would say that's okay. I don't know, but but churches can decide. I think the way they want to function. This is why we have the separation of church and state. Government shouldn't be telling churches, well, you could have, you could do it. You know, you you should say what you believe whatever you want. No, churches have a particular tradition and views that they uphold, and they decide that for themselves with their leadership, with their sessions, with the you know whatever their view is going to be on this or that issue. Um, so I think that's a little bit different. I think the church does kind of believe things and they believe what they believe is correct. But then people who are in that church also live in a democratic society where they then must rub up against people who have different views, right, than what is being preached to them on Sunday morning. And we need to strike that balance between the two. And I don't think the Christian right is particularly interested in striking that balance in the way that we need it to be stricken <laughs> for 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 democracy to for democracy to survive am i clear does that make sense i mean i'm, I'm you know i think i think it's you know i wouldn't just i don't want to come across saying like i you know just believe anything right because within church communities you do believe you have confessions of faith right you mm -hmm. you you believe things right i mean and, and america separation of church and state allows you to do that and when government starts to interfere with that i think we have a problem just like we have a problem when christians can't figure out how to live in a democratic society it goes the other way too right any other questions oh there's andrew andrew you're muted andrew uh, uh, thanks john uh, great great talk today i mean you talked about setting the stage of the debate and i think one of the concerns um around a number of our uh politicians on the right is that um they have they come from some very particular traditions as i understand it let's say ted cruz and i think his denomination is uh, called doc dominionism yeah. um, on the catholic side you know bill barr uh amy um the new supreme court justice i'm sorry I'm getting, yeah I'm getting right they come from particular traditions and and you know they're you know they were probably more extreme on on the right and yet they're kind of moving as you know i'm sure you're familiar with the term the overton window in terms of the conversation and and in a sense appearing like they're representing the more mainstream yeah. of uh evangelicalism or catholicism yeah. and yet you know they're really pulling the conversation quite a bit to the right no absolutely um you know, and I think I think people like you know, I, I, you know I, 
Amy Coney Barrett's an interesting case. I'll just pick on this one because I only have a couple minutes left here. But uh, Amy Coney Barrett's an interesting case. Um, certainly, she has very, very conservative positions on most social and moral issues and mm-hmm. comes from this, this kind of wing of Catholicism that right embraces these kinds of conservative ideas that want to bring the kingdom of God right to America, which is, you know, we could talk about that too. I think sometimes that's often misunderstood, right? In, in a kind of dominionist way, right? You know, oh, we're going to make America a theocracy, right? Well, Christians talk about bringing the kingdom of God in all kinds of ways. King King talked about it all the time, right? You know, a, you know, what is the kingdom of God? It's a reflection of, you know, if Jesus were king, right? What would our society look like? So I don't want to, I don't want to get off track on that, but you know, I think the the point you're making here, Andrew, is when when Amy Coney Barrett's hearings took place. And the senators pushed her on her faith, her dogma, as um, Senator Dianne Feinstein called it. Um, I think Amy Coney Barrett's answers were always within the tradition of American uh, pluralism and democracy when she would try to say, my beliefs have nothing to do with the way I would interpret the law. Now, that is the right answer. (laughs) <laughs> you know, but whether or not we'll see what happens, right? You know, I mean, that's that's the right answer to make in front of the Senate, you know, but but I think people like Ted Cruz and others um, are embracing this idea of Christian nationalist politics. They do want to exactly. And this is why I said this Christian nationalism is getting a voice and has been empowered within the last five years or so in a way that we have never seen it before. Um you know, I mean, Clarence Thomas and Amy Coney Barrett are not that different in their in their views of the Constitution. Clarence Thomas was nominated in the 80s. So like this stuff has been around for a long time. Um, but you are now seeing it, especially in the House of Representatives and the Senate, when, um, you know, this kind of Christian nationalism or even the kind of some of, I don't want to get too political here, but some of the insurrectionists on January 6th, who flew Christian flags to kind of reclaim the capital for Christ. It has definitely become more mainstream. And again, back to the answer to Bill's question, it is not, it is so kind of fundamentalist and narrow and has such a certain sense of certainty about it that doesn't come from any kind of rational thinking, enlightenment thinking. It comes from like God told me to do this, right? Providentialism. That um, I think it's I think it's dangerous. Uh, in that sense, and um, I'll just leave it at that. John, just a maybe a parting shot uh, in the time little bit of time we have left. As we're thinking this coming week, what is there a question or a thought? We, as we're watching the news, as we're reading papers, as we're yeah, yeah. Um, that we might be looking for or thinking about. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, just you know, again, looking, looking, and sort of reflecting on this, right? See the way in which no one comes right out. Like, for instance, no one says like, "I'm a Christian nationalist." Most people who are Christian nationalists see this word as a derogatory word to describe them. It's like no one anymore wants to be called a fundamentalist. You know, it, 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 you know, it's narrow, it's dogmatic, right? Um, so no one's going to use the phrase Christian nationalist, but you watch, watch certain um, conservative politicians, usually evangelical conservative politicians, when they invoke um, rights, rights coming from God, right? Uh, we're not going to take away our God-given rights because we were founded as a Christian nation and God gave us these rights and the founders gave us these rights. We don't want to wear a mask. We don't want to take the vaccine because it impedes on our rights. We don't want, again, I'm just, you know, whatever you think about these things, fine. I'm just, you know, you want me to, you know, you, you want to you want to see how this, this idea is manifested in the news and so forth. I think, um, you know, even gun gun debates, right? You know, we'll see what comes up this week. But but all of these things are, or Joe Biden's view on abortion or marriage is somehow undermining um, American values, right? Well, what are those American values? That we're a Christian nation, usually, right? 
Um, last time I checked, it's it's really hard to find um, the right to bear arms in scripture, you know, but yet it's a God-given right. You know, Thomas Jefferson said it was a God-given right. I'll give you that. <laughs> so, you know, think about this as, as, as people who maybe are serious about Christian faith and biblical, biblical principles, you know, to what extent is this kind of Christian nationalism reflecting, say, the teachings of Jesus or something? And maybe sometimes you might find it does, right? But, but also, where does it rub up against it? Thank you. You've given us some things to think about and look for and watch and uh, hopefully um, come back again next week to uh, maybe we should start next week with the quiz. I'll say, where have you seen Christian nationalism this week? Uh, well, you're, you're <laughs> not a bad it. idea. <laughs> you got Thank your you, homework, everyone. your marching order. That's show, right. So, That's right. Uh, um, We'll talk Thank about the so Bible. We'll get back. We'll get into the 18th century next week. Right. So a little, a little safer ground. <laughs> Have a good day. Thank you, John. Yep. Folks, join us again.